Welcome. Thanks for having us up here. Thanks for the uh, beautiful flyover last night looking at green crops. Uh, is that the right one? Because it's. Nice. across. You still got it in your hand. Yeah, he turned it off. Sorry. You're sneaky, mate. I thought you said you were my mate. Stitch me up. Right, uh, um, got a bit to cover here, so we'll hook into it. Rotating buys your time, and mixing buys your shots. Um, I'm only covering part of the herbicide solution to a herbicide problem, so other speakers are going to talk about non-herbicide uh, solutions today. I'm going to touch on getting the most out of what we've got left, I guess. So This is where I come from, and that's what it can look like. Uh, our cropping system is winter dominant south of the border, so we're probably 65-70% winter crops, that's some of what we grow. Uh, and then we crop summer crop as well, and we grow pretty well the five different summer crops, although we haven't seen a lot of mung beans or sunnies lately. That's what we're looking like at the moment on the left. Similar challenges everywhere. Uh, I've spent a bit of time up here in the 90s and I'm sure things aren't that much different to where we are. So. We're all facing similar challenges. That's what we look like at the moment for stored moisture. I think that's the lowest ever. That's a long, long, or a long fallow, sorry, uh, in our country. And this was Drew Penberthy's idea of what sort of moisture probes we should be using to plan our cropping rotations. <laughs> so I'd say he nailed it there. Did very well. Rotation buys your time, mixing buys your shots. The first question I pose here is do I want to buy into this? So I've had growers that have just thrown their hands up when they came across resistance, ignored it for a couple of years, built up a massive seed bank and then sold the farm. So you have to take pause when you see a resistance issue, step back and say, right, oh, we need to tackle this together. So we've got to make a plan. We don't want to start doing something and half do it. We've really got to decide that we're going to commit to this. I looked at a farm last Friday with one of my growers and any time I get a sniff that they're looking at a new farm, I strap the soil coring rig on the ute, grab him, leave the agent behind, and we go for a drive around that farm and just have a dig, see what's there. We drove around the farm on Friday and we found resistant ryegrass. We know there's bad resistant black oats on the farm. There was big barnyard grass frames like that in amongst the sorghum. We took about three soil cores and went, no, I don't think we need to take this on. <laughs> so it was really someone else's problem that was asking a premium price for uh, our expertise to manage. But anyway, so now we'll get into, we're committing, we're buying into it, this is what we need to do. We need to rotate our active groups to significantly delay the onset or, or to manage our resistance. We need to understand and manage our modes of action. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Watch for cross resistance between modes, that is the thing. I've got a couple of case studies of just some of the main weeds and, and resistance levels that we're dealing with. Uh, and then we look at mixing, so this is where we get to have fun with our magic potions. Not many of these are, are, uh, are listed or labelled, but we get to have a play and work out. This is one of the wild ones, the mystery of synergies of mixing herbicides and seeing what happens. Uh, always refining, rate, mixing order, adjuvants, timing, volume, economics, and then uh, being prepared to share your secrets to, to help each other out, I guess. So rotating, we want to avoid accelerating target site and metabolic resistance by changing resistance mode. So any mechanism that there is in that plant, we're not giving it the chance to, to operate again. We're changing modes of action so that resistance mechanism lays still basically so it doesn't give a competitive advantage to that particular genetics. And if there is a fitness deficit to that, that particular mutation, then it starts to drop off in the population. So that's part of what I mean by rotating away from that product or that active. Um, group A's and B's are particularly susceptible if we go six generations of, of ryegrass with one active with a group A we can potentially build resistance, it's been done. And something I don't know if you've, if you've come across it up here but we're, we're looking at the new uh, Clearfield or Emi Tolerant sunflower variety and the, the background to that genetics was a a wild sunflower type in a, in a paddock of soybeans in America and that paddock had been soybeans for seven years in a row, seven spinnakers in a row, so seven immies in a row and that sunflower survived. So that was the background to what we now have as a clear field sunflower. Gives you a fair idea what we should and shouldn't be doing with immies, doesn't it, in our system and I, I look forward to 
Spac's talk later about, and, uh, and Sarah's talk too, about how we should be better stewarding our, our Emmys in the system. Not that. Uh, let's have a look at, so one of the mode of action, Group A, we've talked about. You can read up on those and what it does. Typically what we see is that shrinking and dying off of the growing point. So when we've done a Group A spray, we pull the growing point out and check that we're having an effect there. And these are some of the grasses that have already developed resistance to Group A. You probably recognise a few of those. Case study number one for us was uh, coming across Group A resistance, so that kicked off around Cropper Creek in 2008. Oh, sorry, in 1998, so 20-odd years ago. And this is just a typical uh, analysis, I guess, a resistance analysis. I encourage you to test. It's easy to, to spray and say, yep, that didn't work. It's definitely resistant to that, but what else is it resistant to? So here we've got... Uh, and Group A's are funny. You can have you know, only 20% survive a verdict, 100% survive a topic. Both FOPs, but there is a bit of difference there. Actual or DEN, it's also in that Group A. And then Clethodim Select also in Group A. So a little bit of variation there, but all Group A resistant. Uh, how do we manage it? Test for some of the things that you might want to use. So don't just test for what you think it's resistant to. Test for what you might want to use. Completely susceptible to Atlantis, so that's our first choice for that. And we need to grow wheat to be able to use it. Sorry, so our old plan, we just used topic, verdict, and actual, just flogged them, just kept rolling them around with the crop scenarios that we had. Ended up in that spot. So plan B with our uh, zero till or minimum, minimum till system was to, yep, we can use Atlantis, Rexade, Inovix, and any, also group B, so we can rotate to group Bs in wheat. In fact, we, as a group of consultants, sat around at a table and said, hey, we should all use group Bs in wheat so that we can still use actual in barley. Um, <clears throat> so just trying to get a little bit cooperative on that as well, I guess. We found really interestingly that there was that difference in FOP and DIM resistance. When we swapped from a verdict to a clethodim or select in, uh, in chickpeas, we didn't get complete control even though we had susceptibility there, but we found when we mixed the two, that's one of those mystery synergies I was talking about, we get complete control at the right rate with sulphate of ammonia and the right oil and etc. etc. So we continue to use that and, and 10 years on we're still getting a result out of that FOP DIM mix. Uh, on black arts. How long? Not sure. Got to be careful with it. Maybe chase some, some new registrations of group B's in those crops. Canola, we're on mostly clear field. I'd say 98% of our canola is clear field, but we also spike that up sometimes with a, a FOP or a DIM. Barley is our weakest link. We're using actual air, but now with Spartacus we're using clear field. Let's not go too hard on that one. Fallow, we can use different and lots of different uh, herbicide options and other options obviously in fallow. But we're relying too heavily on actual still in barley. We've got too much imi in that system so we're starting to really get concerned. Things like group B resistant phalaris are coming up from old glean use. So our current plan has been to, oh gee that's overlapped a bit down there, sorry is to use residuals and that's really a challenge for us because as I said we're zero till or minimum till so how do you how do you incorporate things that incorporate how do you use herbicides that require incorporation when you're not really moving soil so but it is interesting if you run an NDF planter at the right speed you will get just the right amount of soil throw uh, across between two rows so it can be done we're, we're playing with that working with it and trying to become a, a master of something else that we hadn't really had a crack at before and there's a whole lot of options there that we open up a whole lot of different groups, the D, J's and K's mostly. Um, and, the, and then keeping an eye out for new products. So there's a new active coming from BASF. It's a new, completely new mode of action. It's group Z for now, but that will be reallocated most likely to a new group. So keeping an eye out on what's coming, understanding their solubility, their binding coefficients, all that sort of uh, information that we need to know. Go and attend a... Um, Congress workshop, uh, Mr. Congrey from, from ICANN does a great job of explaining all that in residuals. Uh, and this box you can't read said, then what? 
So when we've done that and that and the other, and, and where do we go then? So we're now like bailing seed destruction, as Max said. Green on green, we'll hear about today. New actives. Case study two, so that was really a winter one. This one's a summer one. Uh, all our resistant summer grasses. So Ornless Barnyard grass, mate, talked about. Uh, 2008, that turned up. And it, yeah, it was our fault. We had too many, too many glyphosates. We were still trying to squeeze a group I in with glyphosates and doing half a job on grasses to try and kill some other, probably flea bone or something at the time. So <clears throat> just understanding that and having to separate that out. Um, yeah, and quite challenging combinations as you have up here, feather top roads, barnyard, liver seed, windmill. I don't know, do you get windmill grass up here? Pretty well treated like feather top road. It's a similar beast. Sweet summer, sweet summer. Sweet summer grass up here, yep. And flea bone. Plenty happening there. So this is some of the plan that we're, we're trying to incorporate and you'll see the picture up here stays the same the whole way through this series of slides. It is a massive game of chess and as I said it's trying to incorporate residuals but still manage a, a rotation. Then you get a year like we've got where your rotation's gone but really we've just missed one whole year. We just step forward, stay on rotation. We still get the benefit of what we've done up till now. So this is what we're doing in fallow. This is what we're doing in summer crop. A whole lot of alphabet up there, Mac. Lots of little letters trying to, to move around through the different groups, get the best out of each one. This desiccation of crops, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Like it's hard to get those buggers in time. Like it, it's really a, you, you wanna, don't wanna be relying on that at all. It's um, for other reasons as you've highlighted, but it's just trying to use every tool that we've got. Um, Inter-row work, uh, shielded sprays, that sort of thing, inter-row cultivation. Winter crops, we're trying to use products in our winter crop that will give us some residual in that spring. So before, while the winter crop's still in the paddock, and we've got uh, feather top germinating in late July or into August, uh, September. Um, there's a few actives there that we can use. And of course, there's, there's still weaknesses in that system. So our reliance is on group A's. Um, verdict and select without a double knock so where they're being used in crop we're not getting a double knock on them in, obviously in mungs or sunnies or cotton uh, potential for overuse of intervix uh, in our sentinel or clearfield sorghum and, and clearfield sunnies coming down the track uh, dual gold across fallows and many crops so we're, we're we're using quite a bit of herbs metallic oil and again then what what else are we doing we're chipping Let's look at green on green, lasers, new actives, what else can we do? Rightio, so that's rotating. I'm going to talk a bit about mixing uh, and, and therefore getting a bit more time. So buying us an extra shot each time. We're using a couple of different actives to target the same weed or maybe a mix of actives doing a couple of different weeds at the same time. Um, we don't have to go we can go a fair way back to find a mix, can't we? So proprietary mix is the old touchdown. Um, and I, I've put innovations there in inverted commas because a lot of companies are coming to us now with mixes that we're already using, but they're now batched up in a bottle. So it's recognised that it's, uh, it's quite often a good way to go. Uh, and then we've got this homemade brew. So all that list of things that, that Spacco tucks in his back, back of his mind and doesn't, you know, like it's, ooh, will I bring this one out now? Or, and we've got those sort of that information that we pass to each other that we work out. No, oh, yeah, this this roundup surpass alloy mix that was fantastic. Well, that looked after fellows for 20 years, but it's actually not doing the job now because that group I was just mucking up our our grass job. Um, Rightio. Let's talk about mixing actives to buy shots. When mixing, ensure the following products are chemically compatible. That's ugly. Jeez, we've seen a few of those. Biologically compatible, I'll show a few slides of that one. So just, we can get them chemically compatible in the boom, but actually getting it out and doing the job in the paddock is critical. Um, we don't want to compromise control of other weeds when we're hitting our target weed with a mix. Uh, using residuals, be careful of that. We'll hear more about that later on. Be considerate of the operator. Mac talked about paraquat and the safety. Uh, be considerate of the cost. You can come up with a fantastic agronomic mix, but if it's 70 bucks a hectare, it's probably not going to get off the ground. So I just want to go through a few examples after this of, of what we're doing. So biological antagonism. I won't spend a lot of time on these couple of graphs, but 
This would be a, a discriminating dose, so a quarter of a litre, say, of glyphosate on a barley seedling in the winter time, and just having a look at what different, same active, different wetter packages or additives to the glyphosate, and then what happens when we throw uh, a group I in there. Now, how much does that reduce the original job? How much of that can we recover by adding the right adjuvants? And then on this next slide, busy one I know, but just bear with me. Again, glyphosate, add a group I, add a, a surpass, add an amicide 625, double the rate of that. This is all what's happening to your glyphosate job. Try and recover that by doubling your glyphosate rate. So from 250 mils going to 500 mils with this amicide here. So they're going from there up to there by doubling your glyphosate rate, add a bit more glyphosate, we get an extra little bump there, 90%, but we're still leaving weeds behind. Um, and then all the different group eyes are thrown in here for just an example of how much you knock around a glyphosate rate or glyphosate job with different group eyes, even the esters. So you've got a ester 680 or a, or a 570 LVE. I think you know all that, so it's probably, we don't need to labour that one. Timing of sprays is critical to avoid weed set. How many times have we seen this little bugger? He's an inch and a half high and he's setting seed already. We've got to be out in the paddock checking these things. It's not that common, but occasionally we'll put a plane over red country just to hit that first flush and then come back and do the whole, whole paddock with, with a boom. So we make sure we've got that, that first hit of button grass on the red country. This is a group of my mates up in Papua New Guinea. I had the opportunity to do a few years consulting up there. and um, These guys had a boom spray. We organised one for them. They grew some fantastic sorghum crops, but when it came time to put a, a spray out... Sorry, the boom spray was... Now, no, I had the boom spray, but they didn't want to drive over the crop. I'd organised a plane for them to come down and spray it. This was a fipronil spray, just a six grams per hectare, very light rate. And I got a photo of this. This is a new boom spray. I went, oh, crap, you can't put people in the paddock doing this. It was OK for that job, but the next spray was Gemstar. That was going to be fine, but, you know, I never even talked about paraquat up there. Thankfully, Mac, I didn't, didn't even touch it. And yet I walked into a shop and there's one litre bottles of paraquat up behind the counter. Crikey. They are tough individuals, but I wouldn't expose them to that. <clears throat> so just looking after our operators, making sure we do things right. Mixed components don't have to be equal, just effective. So often it's just a spike rate, isn't it, that does the job. So there might be one product doing the heavy lifting and then you put something else in it. And this is a, an example in, uh, in Paratrooper. I don't know if you've come across it. It's pretty well a paracrot brew at 250 grams active, but it's got a small amount of amitrol in it. And that little bit of Amitrol has been doing quite a good job on our flea bone, not only in a knockdown sense, but also just retarding that regrowth. But something we learn out of that exercise and we've had to push the boundaries has been water volume and oil uh, in our application. And, I, and we'll talk a bit more about that with our, our Group Gs <clears throat> and what we've learnt there. So I guess some of the mixes that we use that, that we've found to be really effective, um, Paraquat, uh, and triazine, so when we're establishing a crop, if we've done a, a roundup pre-plant uh, pre or close to planting and then we're putting our residuals down, quite often that works so well with a double knot uh, with paraquat. So adding paraquat and oil to any of these triazines really does a, a, a good knockdown job on a broad spectrum of weeds, including flea bone. This one I love, this spinnaker paraquat oil mix is fantastic. I, I really like that one. I'm, just prior to mungs or, or other pulses. Uh, there's something going on in that brew as well that's pretty handy, I reckon. And then Jewel Gold is a mixed partner. It's extremely compatible. So we can go down with your glyphosate as your PSPE. We've now got registration for it in fallow. So that was where we really like to be able to put it down in front of rain instead of after our planting rain. So if you can get Jewel Gold down prior to that August rain or September rain that you're going to plant your summer crop on, Fantastic, get another shot down PSPE or again now there's a registration in crop. That's probably my last preference but we can also put it down in front of a flush in crop. So we've got another option there. I touched on water volume I, and I, I guess it's, uh, it's really interesting when we talk about residuals in, herbs, in our winter crops, I, I first talk about a hay baler. I said, boys, are you interested in owning a hay baler? Oh, geez, no, I don't want to touch one of those. Right, well, let's talk about residuals. 
And so in this job with our summer fellows, particularly talking about water volume, I'd, I'd go for a sticky around the back of the shed and say, have you still got some tillage gear on this farm? Oh, no, I've only got a 12-foot scarifier. No, no, I haven't got enough men to, to, to work this gear and, and, you know, the price of fuel now. I go, OK, how about we just go to 150 litres of water as an application rate? And when you go to that extreme and come back to 150 litres of water, it's still painful, but it's a different perspective, isn't it? So I love these little guys, the twin jet nozzles, uh, and we're putting more tanks on farms. We're getting more rainwater off our, off our sheds to spray with. Uh, we've found at the high water volumes, a lot of our northern countries got cap and pipe bore schemes where there's a, a tank in every paddock. We're actually sucking them dry. We've got to put two tanks there now just to get the water volume and, and uh, get the job that we need to do. As I said, with that paraquat, but also with our Group Gs. Righto, effective fallow mixes for these puppies. This is the one I'm most nervous about talking about up here and, and talking about anywhere really. Adding a Group A herbicide to glyphosate in fallows has been shown to improve control of grass seedlings. So a three-way mix of, of glyphosate, sledge, a select clethodim, uh, and sledge with sulphate of, of ammonia and oil, that, that's our dynamite summer fallow brew across all grasses. But, so we've got a group G in there that's quite active on grass. We've got a glyphosate, we've got a group A, so we've got three different active groups in that mix. We're looking after it with sulphate of ammonia and oil and water volume. But geez, if we miss a weed there, what have we just unravelled? Mung beans, verdict select, cotton, sunflowers, like we've just we can't afford to lose our Group A's for those other crops. So, if anyone's tempted to do put a Group A down in fallow and they're not double knocking it or not checking the paddock to make sure nothing said seed, set seed, if you could just line up up the side there and all the agronomists will give you a slap up the back of the year on the way out. It's such a critical thing for us to cover off, and, and I'm not here amongst all my mates on at Moree, so I know I'd get the slap up the year, but. You're probably too polite to give it back to me, but that's that's something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. Like we can use it, we get a great result, but you just got to be so careful how we use that in our system. That's just a little roundup of what I've said. Another group of mixes that are very effective our, for our glyphosate resistant milk thistle. So we've got them, hands up if you've got glyphosate resistant milkies up here. Has anyone tested or found? Yep, hang on to it. You don't want to end up where we are with that one, the Downs and, and uh, Liverpool Plains particularly. We're just getting it starting uh, around Moree. We've still got one Group I that's, that's pretty well always been effective on milkies, and that's 75D. I don't know why, but it does the job. Paratrooper at 2.4 in that high water volume with oil. And Sharpen, I guess, has been doing a lot of heavy lifting on that milk thistle job for us, and particularly on the Plains as well. Um, not very rate responsive, so you can, you can be at the lower rate as long as you've got the, the good water volume and oil percentage. It is light sensitive, but understand that about your Group Gs. Treat them like paraquat. Put them on in low light situations so that your other actives get to do a job before they burn the plant out. So you might have seen a, a Group G glyphosate job on upright milkies where you've burnt the plant, looks fantastic at day seven. You come back a month later and it's all regrown from the base because your, your systemic just hasn't done the job. And that was put on in broad daylight. So try and get under cloud. Again, I'll, I'll make enemies in the room, but be doing some evening spraying into the night spraying to get those actives, to, to get the, the most out of them, basically. And uh, talk to Sarah, we've got a new, a new sharpen, basically. It's, it'll have two actives in it. One of those will have some more regrowth suppression. Fleabane, touched on it before. Glypho mixes with picloram. Uh, it has been our mainstay for a long time, double knocked within that 5 to 14 days. Be careful of your residuals, Spac will talk about that. Paratrooper again, and then sharpen with glypho or paraquat on small flevone does the job as well. And that's just exa an example of straight glypho, glypho with picloram, better root release. You can see more dirt left on that one when we pulled it out. This is only a week, a week or so in from being sprayed. That's what happens when you leave them, you end up with a gap in your crop, you end up with other weeds coming, you don't get a crop off that. You can't go and target it, you're in crop, so there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, it just perpetuates, doesn't it? The seed set and then that bit of fallow that comes springtime, that's away again with fleabane all over it. 
We talked about that FOP dim mix being a game changer and, and it's still working for us, but we've got to be careful. A dim dim mix is, is coming out on top in ryegrass further south, so that's another one that's you wouldn't expect, but it's there. Actual and, actual and glean, just, I, I guess you've come across that alloy or, or glean mix with the actual giving a really good hit on, uh, on Phalaris particularly. Atlantis and Bromoxynil, a group B, group C, just a good mix for us in on small broadies, but on, on group A resistant oats. That was a mung bean job, uh, no residual grass spray, but barnyard grass that we knew was resistant came up all through it. Just did a, got a really good brew down of, of uh, Verdict Select Mix with the right gear and, and tidied everything up, just cleaned it up like Roundup used to. It was fantastic. And a couple of desiccant mixes, so glyphosate and sharp and registered in, in chickies and favours now. Quite handy. Um, glyphosate and alloy in chickies and mungs. And then the obvious three-way mix in chickpeas that we used in 17 where we had a lot of regrowth and green, green top growth in chickpeas. Just be careful on seed crops and be careful of MRLs. Uh, what, yeah. Where's our most likely glyphosate or paraquat replacement going to come from? How heavily are we relying on those two herbicides at the moment? Um, we've got to be looking down the track at what else might be coming. Uh, the Group Gs have started to take up some of that role. Like we're really starting to look at how we use a sharpen by itself to do a job or uh, or a sledge on grasses, etc. So again, we've got some new group group G's coming. We need to spend the time in the paddock to learn how to use them, compare notes, get the most out of them, uh, and and be able to continue using those products for as long as possible. Uh, I had the privilege to go to the UK a month or two ago with Syngenta. That's a flea bone. That's a Palmer amaranth. They're working on some really handy new actives there that'll fit somewhere in that glyphosate paraquat window. Uh, very broad spectrum and pretty handy. We can't rely on new actives coming out all the time, we know that. But geez, it's nice to see one coming. I reckon that could be, a, could be very helpful. So, in summary, rotating herbicide groups is an effective way of slowing resistance build up, managing resistance while ever we have actives at work. Um, please pay attention for the rest of the day to all the other jobs that are going to help us keep our actives going. Mixing from the same or separate active groups gives us room to move. Caution needed with group A's in fallow, I covered that. But everything I've talked about is a herbicide tactic, so let's listen up to what other actives and uh, what other activities we can be up to uh, to do the job as well. Alright, I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay.